Okay, good morning, everyone. I think it's uh, it's about time to start. <clears throat> I want to welcome you all to the 18th webinar of uh, Instruct Eric on uh, the topic struct structure meets function. Um, so it's the 18th webinar already, and actually the second one from uh, from Instruct NL that we're hosting. And uh, we're pleased today to have actually three presentations. Uh, we have one guest presentation that was. Uh, uh, that is Simone, who was actually uh, supposed to present during the previous webinar on uh, hosted by Instruct Italy. Uh, and before we start, I uh, have an announcement and uh, a short introduction on uh, on Instruct for those people who are joining now but are not too familiar with Instruct. So, what is Instruct? It's a uh, European research infrastructure um, that provides uh, service um, uh, access to services related to uh, structural biology. Uh, to member countries. So currently we have 14 member countries that have all kinds of different facilities and, and centers available for people to, um, to access. Uh, and access includes uh, research resets, um, internships, um, also training. And uh, I think the, maybe the most interesting one is that uh, there's uh, significant funding for, uh, for hosting um, visitors to these, uh, to these sites. So if you're interested, please have a look at, at the Instruct website and uh, where you can find much more information. And I won't go too much into detail. And the, the second part is uh, the announcement. <clears throat> um, as many of you may know that uh, within almost a month, there will be the uh, Instruct biannual uh, conference that will be held in Utrecht here in the Netherlands. Um, I've been told that there's still a few seats available. So if you're interested, I would really uh, suggest that you uh, register as quickly as possible. There's a, a great lineup of, uh, of speakers on uh, all different kinds of topics related to structural biology. So, uh, and in addition, Utrecht is a very nice city. And um, so I hope that the last seats will be, uh, will be filled up and we have a, a complete uh, uh, set of uh, um, visitors. So with that, um, I would like to go to the to the to the webinar of today. Um, just before starting, um, one announcement: if you would like to ask questions to the speakers, we will have a, a, a Q and A session after each presentation. Uh, please type in your name followed by the question in the Q and A. Uh, please do not use the raise hands or the chat for for any of these. Um, so please type in your questions in the Q and A. <clears throat> and with that, uh, I would like to. Uh, um, Welcome the first speaker. As I said, we have a, a guest speaker, um, which uh, is Simone. Um, Simone Fjordsheid from, from Aarhus University in Denmark. Um, she performed part of her research in, uh, in the Instruct Italy Center, and uh, she will present today data on the uh, metabolism of um, uh, hepatocytes, and uh, she used in-cell NMR. So with that, um, I will stop sharing and give the floor to Simone. Please. Can everybody hear me? And I don't know, just one second. Okay, the video is there. And now hopefully you should be able to see um, my presentation. Yeah, we can see it. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, but first of all, all of you welcome and thanks for coming to this presentation of mine. As Patrick said, I went to the Instruct Center in uh, Italy and I'm a first year PhD student. And in the following presentation, I'll be talking about how to use Intel NMR for doing metabolomic studies. And the title of the presentation is a real-time approach to study cellular metabolism in hepatocytes. And as Patrick already mentioned, it's conducted in collaboration with the Center of Magnetic Resonance at University of Florence, the Instruct Center of Italy. So within the next 15 minutes, I would like to explain to you how I use the Intel NMR for doing metabolomic fingerprinting. However, in order to reach to this point, I would like to give you a short introduction about bioreactors and what they are, some important points when looking at metabolomics, and then how the Intel NMR uh, bioreactor is constructed. And then of course, finally, how I use the setup in studying metabolomics of the hepatocytes. So first of all, a short introduction. And what is a bioreactor? In this particular setup, the bioreactor is actually a core element. Um, so 
In a definition, when you take a bioreactor, it refers to any manufactured device or system that supports a biological active system. So this means that the bioreactor could contain, for example, enzymes, it could contain microorganisms, mammalian cells, etc. And in my case, it will contain mammalian cells. Um, so in order to design this appropriate bioreactor for maintaining the viability of the mammalian cells, it's important to optimize the physiological and chemical environment for the mammalian cells. This means that it's important to look at the cell growth, the metabolism of the cells, the genetic manipulation and the protein expression or other types of expressions, etc. As all of these parameters are needed in order to understand the cells requirement on their physical and chemical environment. It might also be necessary to control and optimize the bioreactor environment via operating variables, like for example, flow of the, of the medium through the bioreactor to favor the desired uh, cells and their conditions. Furthermore, bioreactors come in many different size from industry, it's thousands of, it can be up to thousands of liters and later on, I'll define the size of the bioreactor for the Intel NMR. And as you see, it's in the very small end of the, of the scale. And then for a short introduction to metabolomics. And metabolomics is the scientific study of chemical processes involving metabolites. And in metabolic studies in vitro, you can obtain a phenotypic fingerprint of the metabolites expressed in a cell and in a typical in vitro setup for metabolic analysis, you will have static conditions and you will need to do several setups in order to see the metabolic profiles at different times. This means that you get kind of like a snapshot of the metabolic profile at certain times as illustrated here by the three green arrows after 14 28 and 56 hours. But as you also see from the green arrows, it's very important to obtain these um, snapshots at the correct time, because if we look at metabolite A, we will only see the first peak here after 14 hours, and we will not be able to see the second peak after approximately 42 hours, and metabolite B we will not be um, detecting at all by making these several setup if we choose these three time points. And it might also be difficult to know when is the correct time to take these snapshots. However, if we use Intel NMR, it will be possible to do a continuous measurement of their metabolite profile throughout the entire experimental time, which is illustrated here by the orange um, arrow. Furthermore, it will also be possible to do it all in one setup and do it in real time, not having to quench the cells and extract or measure the metabolites, but actually do it in real time while the cells are still alive. And this is a very great advantage and make it very relevant to try to establish this um, method. Um, so let's take a closer look at their Intel NMR uh, equipment. And the Intel NMR equipment was the equipment that I went to Un University of Florence Center of Magnetic Resonance to learn to use. And as you see here is kind of like an animated figure of how the entire system looks. You have the bioreactor here in the sample chamber and it can be placed directly into the magnet. And if we take a closer look at the bioreactor, then you can see it over here. And you see that the total volume of the bioreactor is 500 microliters, meaning that we have a very, very small scale. And in here we have the hepatocytes encapsulated in the hydrogel. It's kind of like the blurred region. And then we have an orange tube leading into the bioreactor, constantly supplying with fresh medium from the medium reservoir which is placed outside um, the magnet. In the animation here, you see that the inlet is the green tube and the outlet is uh, the blue tube that goes into waste. 
The outlet in the bioreactor over here is placed in the top, meaning that the medium is let in through the bottom and constantly make sure that all of the cells has a flow of, of fresh um, medium. So with that said, we have kind of like established a background knowledge for seeing, okay, what is required in this um, particular setup. And we all know that in order to obtain proper and reliable results, we need a very um, stable and good experimental setup. So my experimental setup was that I did, first of all, I prepared the hepatocytes. And when the cells were ready, I encapsulated them inside the hydrogel and I placed it in the NMR tube. Then I assembled the NMR tube to the entire insulin NMR uh, bioreactor system. And it made it possible for me to place the bioreactor inside the NMR spectrometer and record NMR spectra. And then of course, in the end, I wanted to see, okay, did I actually manage to maintain my cells alive by determining the viability of the cells at the end of the experiment? And now for some of the results that I obtained um, throughout the visit at uh, Center of Magnetic Resonance. And first of all, I did a pre-study in which I wanted to, of course, determine the viability of the hepatocytes directly following encapsulation in the hydrogel. And for determining the viability of the cells, I used Trifon Blue. And Trifon Blue, as you see here, the molecule is a dye, which when cells are alive and viable, they have intact membranes, meaning that Trifon Blue is excluded and are not able to interact with the cells. Whereas cells with um, non-intact membranes, there the dye can go in and interact, meaning that the dead cells will appear blue. So what I did was, as I told you before, I encapsulated the cells in the hydrogel. And then after that, I applied the Trifon Blue assay. It might be a bit difficult for you here to see that there's actually a hydrogel with cells and that the hydrogel here is covered with PB, around with PBS as it's not assembled yet to the um, Intel NMR equipment, meaning that all of it is, is transparent. But as you will see here, where I took out some of the slices from the hydrogel uh, and applied the Trifon Blue assay, we have very few blue uh, dots and you can also see a few here, meaning that I was actually able to keep up the viability of the cells. And therefore I could proceed with assembling this uh, NMR tube in the next setup to the Intel NMR uh, bioreactor. So that was what I did. And in this case, I have um, kept the cells inside the bioreactor for 48 hours. You see here after zero hours and after 48 hours. And then I wanted to see if I was able to record spectra throughout the entire experimental time. And in the right side of the screen right now, you see a typical NMR spectra used for metabolomic studies, which is a 1D proton CPMG spectra. And I managed to collect spectra approximately every second hour throughout the entire experimental time, meaning that these, the spectra that you see here is actually an overlay of all the spectra collected within these 48 hours. And these spectra are basis for the analysis, which you will see in the next slide um, here, where I did a PCA analysis on all of their collected 1D CPMT spectra. Over here, you see the intracellular metabolites. And in the right side, you see the extracellular metabolites, meaning that it is from the waste that has been through the entire system. And as you see here, there are a difference between each time point, starting here from approximately experimental hour one, 
until experimental hour number 46. And as you see, there's a clear difference over time between all of the spectrum, which is kind of like a good thing because it means that it's possible to observe a difference over time in the Intel NMR setup using these standard metabolomic um, spectra. Furthermore, in the extracellular metabolites, the PCA plot also indicate a difference. More clear difference is seen down here in the bottom. And the time, the point up here, 0, 0.0, is actually the vehicle, meaning that this medium has not passed through the bioreactor comparing to the rest of the points which has been through. And then, of course, now that I was able to see a difference, I also wanted to see, okay, am I actually, are the cells actually alive following the end of the experiment? And therefore, again, I applied the Trifon Blue essay, and this time I applied it to the top, the bottom, and the middle part of the reactor. And the bottom part is closest to the inlet, whereas the top part is closer, closest to the outlet of the medium. And again, cells appear gray if they are alive and blue if they are dead. And as you can see, the viability of the cells is maintained in the bottom of the reactor where we have a lot of gray, meaning alive cells, whereas the viability is highly decreased in the top and in the middle part where the majority of the cells are seems to be dead. So this means that, of course, the cellular viability it's very important to try to um, improve it and some optimization is needed. So to sum up the results that I managed to collect when I was in Florence is that I managed to establish an Intel NMR bioreactor with hepatocytes. And I also showed that it's possible to continuously record 1D proton CPMG spectra throughout the entire experimental time. And hereby, when their cellular viability is improved, to be able to follow the metabolic fingerprints of the cells over time. And of course, that I need to improve their cellular viability in order to have their proper and more stable setup. And finally, I would like to thank the research group of Professor Lucia Banchi at Center of Magnetic Resonance, University of Florence, for having me as a visiting PhD student and for collaboration with the research presented here. I would also like to thank especially Enrico, Dr. Enrico Lukinat and Dr. Letizia Bavieri for help and collaboration with experimental work and NMR. And then I would like to thank my supervisors, Andrew Bernie and Franz Mulder. And of course, Instruct Eric and INEX Discovery, whose support benefited to this research. And that's all I had for you today. And now I would like to hear if any of you have some questions. Thank you very much, Simona. That was a very nice presentation. I think very clear, uh, especially for people like me who are not very familiar with NMR, uh, let alone in-cell NMR. Um, so I noticed already one question in the Q&A, but maybe other people will type as well. So maybe I can start with one question. Um, of course, there's a lot of optimization to be done. Um, so I was wondering, you start with hepatocytes. Is, is there a reason for, for these type of cells to start with? Are they more stable or is it the the, the, uh, the metabolism that, that's interesting to study? Um, it's their metabolism that is interesting to study and it's because of the bigger background kind of like for my um, PhD and therefore I chose this particular cell line. Yeah. yeah. So there's a, one question in the, the Q&A. Um, how do you distinguish between intra and extracellular metabolites? So the intracellular metabolites are from, if I go back to the, um, here, the setup, then I don't know if you can see my mouse, I guess you can. 
So what I distinguished here was that the in intracellular metabolites is those where I measured directly on the, um, the bioreactor inside the magnet. And then the extracellular metabolites there I take from the waste. So basically it's without um, the cells. So it's taken from here. And then it's measured in a separate NMR machine afterwards. Okay. Yeah, that's clear. We got another question from uh, Michal. <clears throat> um, can you actually distinguish between any metabolites? And what about the signals from the hydrogel? So the, here in the CPMG spectra there, depending on the chemical shift, you should be able to determine some specific um, metabolites. And then of course, there can be regions in the spectra around here where some of the metabolites might be overlapping. And in the overlapping regions, it can be more difficult to, to determine. So it's always a very great advantage to have metabolites which can kind of like have separate signals. So in general, when you say that you use NMR for um, metabolite uh, analysis, then you should be able to see between 50 and 200 um, notify between 50 and 200 metabolites, but there might also be regions where you're not able to distinguish and say, okay, this particular signal come from, from one particular um, metabolite. Okay. If it yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, there's another question from uh, Jung Chi. Um, how do you overcome the low sensitivity of the NMR in studying metabolites? Is, is it difficult to do shimming in this approach? Um, so I try, as you can see over here in the, in the bioreactor to kind of like make it very like dense. And of course, when you have a hydrogel which have some kind of flexibility, you, you want to, of course, make it as stable as possible. And that's also kind of like why you have it very highly densely packed uh, in a quite uh, small vo volume. So I try to kind of like see if there's a difference um, between the beginning and the end. But we didn't observe any difficulties in doing the shimming as long as you do it first the 1D and then the 3D shimming, we, we couldn't observe there, there was a particular difficulties. Okay, thank you. Um... Another question from Audrey. Um, can you use in-cell NMR to test different media and distinguish differences based on carbon or nitrogen resources, for example? Um, I mean, yes, you can take, for example, some medium. I would say it might be maybe easier with carbon because there you can easily order medium from mammalian cells without, for example, glucose. And then you can add the glucose separately to the medium afterwards. And it can be, for example, enriched with carbon-13 uh, glucose, and thereby you can be able to measure their carbon-13 uh, as well. OK, thank you. And I think we have a final question. Um, <clears throat> but there will also be signals arising from the extracellular metabolites, right? I mean, you, you measure them separately, like you explained, but still, of course, you measure them as well as they are in the NMR tube. Yeah, there can be also as well signals in from the extracellular. And that's one of the very interesting things to kind of like see if it's possible to make a um, use, for example, something paramagnetic or anything. So kind of like you can exclude or distinguish between extracellular and intracellular and metabolites. And that's also something that is in for optimization. Okay, very good. Um, so Simon, I want to thank you again for the nice presentation and then your clear answers on this. Um, and then we move on to the, to the next speaker, um, who is uh, Christina Gansinger. She is uh, here from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. She's from the Physics Institute AMOLF. And um, she joined uh, AMOLF a couple of years ago, is uh, starting as a group leader here. And uh, I've been in contact with her because she actually accessed Instruct to, uh, to produce proteins 
uh, at our protein facility here in, uh, in Amsterdam. And Christina today will tell us about um, uh, cell membranes and uh, actually assembly of uh, interleukin receptors and uh, also the interplay with, uh, with the, the cytokines that interact with these uh, receptors. And she will also um, yeah, describe how this influences the, the cell membranes. And for, for this, she uses a, a high-end microscope and uh, actually one that she, uh, she built herself. And if I'm correct, she will actually also give us a, a glance on uh, how she actually designed this microscope. So uh, with that, uh, Christina, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks for that uh, nice introduction. And thanks to everyone for attending and having me in the seminar series, even though I'm a structural biologist. Um, I will talk today, as Patrick mentioned, about reconstituting um, signaling proteins, interleukins, and membranes, at least um, uh, how far we got there. And also mention, of course, on the way, the fantastic support we had from Patrick via Instruct. So in my lab at Amulf, we are really interested in how information is processed in immune cell communication on the molecular level. So ligand receptor interactions and how that then kicks off signaling cascades inside the cell. And uh, since most of these um, interactions happen at cell-cell interfaces, we are working with um, a particular model system whereby we replace one of those uh, cells, um, mostly the ligand carrying cell by a supported lipid bilayer system in which we reconstitute cell membrane uh, proteins, cell surface receptors. And then we can study the contacts that immune cells make with these membranes with high resolution microscopy to look at, for example, a distribution of molecules. Uh, here you can see that the big phosphatase CD45 is excluded from cell membrane contacts, for example, as signaling progresses. And uh, on the right side in the video, you can see the recruitment of individual downstream adapter molecules to activated cell surface receptors, in this case, the T cell receptor. And um, today, though, I will mostly focus of the, on the line in my lab where we work with fully bottom-up reconstitution approach, where uh, the big goal would be to really reconstitute um, the signaling pathways in vitro um, but of course, at the moment, because this is a very complicated thing to achieve, we focus mostly on either the intracellular or the extracellular side. And today I will tell you about some work on interleukin signaling where we reconstitute uh, the extra domains in the membrane and study the kinetics of the molecules using single molecule um, microscopy and single particle tracking. And because um, this is very uh, methods uh, heavy approach, uh, we also actually develop a lot of methodology on the way Patrick mentioned, uh, already mentioned the microscope that we build ourselves, but we also develop data analysis tools or labeling tools. And in the second part of my talk, I will tell you about a method that we developed to actually um, gain much longer trajectories in these single particle tracking experiments and also much more information about the underlying uh, processes. So the reason that we got interested in uh, interleukin receptors, um, at least from a biophysical side, is that interleukin-2 and 15 are of immense importance for the immune system. Um, they are key checkpoints in balanced immune responses. They are um, uh, uh, both these interleukins, they are proteins secreted from immune cells when they are activated by the trimeric receptor, uh, of which two subunits are shared between interleukin-2 and uh, interleukin-15. The gamma and the, um, the common gamma chain is the same, and also the interleukin-2, interleukin-15 beta chain. And then they do have an um, interleukin-specific alpha subunit. However, this one doesn't uh, interact, has no signaling domains on the, on the intracellular side and doesn't interact with the JAK kinases that upon ligand uh, binding to this receptor actually phosphorylate um, the beta chain and then uh, start can bind and downstream signaling is induced. So now the, uh, the interesting thing is that um, even though the, the receptor is shared, at least the two signaling subunits are shared between these two interleukins, they do have diverse functions. In particular, for example, interleukin 2 uh, will actually in the end um, lead to an induced cell death, which, um, essentially down-regulating the immune response at the end of an infection. For example, interleukin-15 can't do this and would further sustain the response and essentially also lead um, to autoimmune uh, damage, uh, whereas interleukin-15 uh, is really important to um, create a memory T-cell uh, population um, 
So same receptor, different functions. How is it possible that these two interleukins produce distinct signals using the same pair of signaling subunits? Now, coming from a structural point of view, you may think, or oh, maybe this is because the structure uh, is different in both cases. But uh, this uh, has been solved already a while ago by uh, Garcia, Slab, and Stanford. And actually, um, the uh, structures overlap almost perfectly, no matter whether interleukin 15 or interleukin uh, 2 is found. So it seems really unlikely that any of these subtle changes could lead to uh, marked uh, conformational changes downstream and signaling uh, changes in the signaling of these two interleukins. So uh, being biophysicist by training, what we thought maybe um, at the heart of discrimination paradox lies um, uh, either some kinetic consideration that is that when the receptor assembles in the presence of interleukin 2 or 15, that uh, involves a ligand binding from solution to the 3D diffusion and receptor assembly in 2D. And this could well be different for the two interleukins, um, just the kinetic rates. And so maybe the cell could essentially use a kind of kinetic proofreading mechanism to read out whether interleukin 2 or 15 has bound. Um, and another difference that is quite important is that interleukin 15 tends to signal in cell-cell contacts where the alpha unit is actually expressed by the other cell interacting with the cell that receives the interleukin 15 signal, whereas interleukin um, who uh, binds uh, in, in cis and interleukin, uh, the alpha chain will be expressed by the same cell and the interleukin is soluble. So this reaction geometry could also contribute um, to the discrimination. And um, just to give some motivation for um, uh, why um, 2D experiments or experiments um, reconstituting these receptors in 2D on membranes are important, came from some in silico modeling of these receptor ligand interactions that we did together with a colleague at Amorf uh, using enhanced screen function reaction dynamics where we could simulate the reaction in 2D. Um, because when we look at previous uh, estimates of these uh, of the different um, species that you could expect in the binding process based on 3D kinetics that have been measured by SPR or other bulk methods, it was always predicted that the predominant population is interleukin 2 bound to the alpha chain because it has a really high affinity. Then there's a low population of um, uh, the um, beta and gamma subunits just binding interleukin, and that most of the receptors end up in, a, in this trimeric um, or quadru quadruplex in the end. Um, this is also what we saw in the 2D simulations. However, we found that under all conditions, there's a very high, uh, well, there's a there's a considerable fraction of just the low affinity or medium affinity beta gamma dimer, and that interestingly, um, this uh, the single species of interleukin two bound to alpha is actually almost non-existent because all of that essentially immediately ends up in the full complex. Uh, if we consider the 2D constraint of all of these proteins being present in the same membrane. So this could potentially even explain why blocking this interaction of interleukin 2 and um, the alpha chain has had limited success in the clinic in essentially modulating interleukin 2 um, uh, activity. So the um, system that we want to use to experimentally test these predictions consists of supported lipid bilayers that we make on class cover slips and in which we essentially we constitute the exodomains of the interleukin receptors and then we can measure binding of interleukins from solution uh, or also interleukins bound to lipid vesicles simulating another cell and follow um, the reaction with um, really on a single molecule level having all the receptor subunits labeled um, analyzing trajectories um, for overlap and binding uh, extracting kinetics uh, from these trajectories. But for that, for of course, we first have to make the proteins and, and the membranes. Uh, we have to have a microscope that allows us to have the resolution that we need to dissect these images um, or to get the signal from the individual molecules. And then, of course, we have to measure and analyze. So for the first part, um, collaborating with Patrick uh, on these, uh, one of these instruct grants has been really um, uh, essential for us because uh, we had no experience of insect cell expression before at AMOV, and the protein we obtained from a collaborator was actually degraded and didn't, um, that, uh, was you not know, functional. And uh, with the help of Patrick, we managed now to establish a workflow going, um, we're making plasmids, uh, producing them in insect cells, purifying uh, the proteins, 
and um, this is working really very well um, and still to this to this point. And then we also use a, um, a more involved method to uh, actually fluorescently label these proteins so, because we want site specificity. So we actually have uh, an N-terminal uh, glycine tag that uh, an enzyme called sortase can recognize. And then uh, we have our label bound to a peptide that is then essentially conjugated with the N-terminus by, by, the, by, the, by the enzyme sortase. And we drive this reaction by just adding the peptide in uh, excess. And what's uh, really uh, interesting for us about the system is that we can make the peptide tag to include a strap tag sequence. So this means that we can then later purify only the labeled protein by pulling essentially um, on, that, uh, on that strap tag. And that means that we really get 100% labeled protein in the end, which is very important for our single molecule experiments to have a very high labeling efficiency. Because otherwise, of course, we don't know whether it's a dimer or a, tri or a trimer where one of the molecules is essentially not labeled. So that's important for us. Um, as Patrick already mentioned, um, we uh, built a bespoke microscope for analyzing our samples. And that is because we wanted high resolution three color detection across a, a large field of view. And uh, we also had a challenge, we gave the challenge to the student to build a setup for the minimum amount of money possible, but still with the maximal achievable specs that are currently at least um, uh, kind of thought to be achievable uh, in the community. And this is what came out and we are quite proud of it because it works extremely well. We, uh, uh, it's less than 150K and um, it uh, is also still reasonably uh, user friendly and it, the microscope has its own website because we really care about open science and sharing this with the community uh, where you can also find all the science files partless and, um, and some advice for aligning it as well. Well, putting this all together, we then were able to uh, make the first uh, movies of, uh, in this case, the um, uh, gamma beta uh, dimer uh, interacting with interleukin 15. And uh, we saw uh, quite a few dimers, however, a uh, lot fewer dimers than we expected because uh, we had a really added a very high amount of ligand in the micromolar range and um, that we would expect uh, would uh, make all the molecules dimerize, but we only saw a small fraction, like less than 10%. There was a concentration dependency though, which did make us think that this is not uh, random, but uh, we were really um, left with like, what's going, what's going wrong here? It really doesn't uh, match our expectations. Is it our method or is it the proteins? And that uh, brought us back to Patrick at the NKI because we really wanted to do some more quality control checks on the proteins that we use. So we used uh, the nanotemper machine to check for uh, the folding of the, all the uh, molecules that we put on these bilayers, uh, so the uh, receptor subunits and also the interleukins. And what we found, interestingly, is that uh, all the molecules that we made, also together with Patrick, are perfectly uh, folded and uh, the quality is really nice, but the commercially bought ligands are not. Are not. So uh, most of them uh, are simply uh, probably not folded and functional. And this would also explain why when we uh, did a bulk biophysical measurement of the apparent KD, uh, of in this case interleukin 15 to the receptor, we uh, got a thousand fold higher apparent KD. And in a way it was lucky that we uh, probably saw any interaction at all, uh, having gone to these really high concentrations that nobody else in the field would use, but that mean, meant, meant that we at least saw some interaction at all. So now of course the idea is to essentially um, improve the ligand quality. And in the first instance, we just bought it from a different supplier. And we really hope that this will solve our problem and will allow us to test the model I presented to you earlier. So with that, uh, I want to change to the second part of my talk, uh, but more technical uh, part on single particle tracking. And um, as you saw from the previous slides, like we detect interaction by essentially monitoring co-diffusion of two molecules together. That's, that's our readout for molecular um, binding. And in order to do this with a really high accuracy and statistical, um, high statistical um, uh, uh, yeah, quality, um, we do need long trajectories actually to distinguish chance encounters from real um, events. And also, of course, the length of the trajectory will decide 
um, uh, on the time scale that we can resolve through our experiments. So this was for us at least the major driver to think we think about single particle tracking and how we can ge generate the, the longest trajectories possible. And uh, traditionally, um, the, this is the, the reason that this is at all a problem is that we use fluorophores for labeling for these experiments. And um, they always photo bleach, and that gives us a certain photon budget per dye that we can spread out over time, but we obviously need to detect, still be able to detect it. So that gives us a limited amount of observation time per molecule. And the only way currently around that problem is to use some, uh, uh, a tool called quantum dots, which are essentially uh, a big um, like mineral-like um, aggregates that uh, never bleach and they continuously emit, but they are very large and they are extremely difficult to functionalize monovalently. So, they can cross-link uh, your molecules of interest, which is of course absolutely not something you want in the case of studying protein interactions. So we came up with a DNA-based approach that size-wise sits in between like labeling with a um, protein, uh, fluorescent protein or organic dye, which will bleach, but has um, because of a neat design principle, almost anti-bleach properties as I will explain in a second. So as I already said, if you label with a single dye, this could also be a fluorescent protein, doesn't have to be an organic dye. We really get a fixed window of time until the molecule bleaches, and then it's just invisible for us, um, and it will never recover. And that's usually on the time scale of seconds with some antifade agents, maybe half a minute, but that's really uh, the maximum we can push it. Now, what we came up with together with some collaborators at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, uh, Ralf Jungmann and Petra Schwille, um, is a method based on a super resolution imaging approach uh, called DNA pain, where the label that we add to our protein is a long strand of DNA that is, in, that is itself not labeled with a fluorophore, but that shorter imaging strands labeled with a fluorophore can bind to. And now the point of this, uh, of this method is that as the fluorophores bleach, they are also exchanging resolution. So now if we tune the kinetics of binding, um, to the bleaching rate, then in principle, they are always statistically replaced before they bleach, meaning that we can image, um, well, theoretically at least forever. And um, in, in any case, this should greatly increase trajectory lengths. So now the question, of course, is does this work? And um, I guess I wouldn't be giving this talk if the answer was no. So uh, as I said before, if we image fixed labels, then at least on a time scale of two minutes, um, essentially all uh, molecules are dark. Whereas if we label with this new DNA paint method, uh, we can still image the same number of molecules after 30 minutes. This is a case where the sample that we chose for um, just for testing the method was static. And that's why we can really go up to half an hour the moment the sample is mobile. We are now no longer limited by photo bleaching, but we are limited by the occurrence of connecting um, spots across frames and tracking the motion, which uh, gives us a slightly lower uh, uh, resolution as you will see in a second, but it's still much better than uh, fixed labeling. So how much better is it exactly in terms of numbers? So we did some quantification to calculate the mean uh, trajectory length. And then we found that um, even at very high radiances, which means that we have a really nice signal to noise and uh, can detect spots and frames extremely well, we go up from less than a second uh, a mean trajectory length to a mean trajectory length of three minutes. So that is a 30 fold improvement roughly. And now we can, of course, because it's DNA and that means that we can uh, pick where well, we can really design the sequence to be specific, we can uh, multiplex um, quite readily and uh, develop a sequence for uh, that is orthogonal to the first to do dual dye labeling. And this is what we did to measure protein interactions and what you see in this video here. So all the circle spots are um, actually a dimer. In this case, we use FKBP model system where the dimers are very stable and uh, yeah, uh, we can, from this type of data, calculate uh, off and on rates and um, really track these molecules for much longer. And uh, as I said, that means we can also measure interactions that are slower than what we could previously. And maybe not so much of interest to this community, but of course, something that people have always asked us, okay, this is great. Does this also work on cells? Like if I would like to study the motion of receptors in, in cell membranes rather than artificial membranes. 
this was actually harder to do technically than uh, you may first think because it required us to develop a protocol uh, of uh, attaching the cells firmly to a support that allows still for sufficient exchange of uh, the DNA molecules with the image as friend, um, which we achieved by a PEC layer that is functionalized with an integrine peptide um, for firm cell attachment. Uh, we also had to um, find suitable fluorophores that uh, produce less unspecific binding. But uh, after all these optimization steps, we can now actually track molecules on cell membranes with these or receptors on cell membranes with this method as well. And we are currently working on our first tool um, color data in cells. And this is uh, just a visual impression, like to see that after two minutes uh, in the DNA paint case, we can still nicely um, follow motion across the entire um, uh, visible uh, part of the cell membrane, whereas for single line labeling, this is not the case. Um, the trajectories are on average 10 times longer. This, we think we can still improve this. And um, the diffusion, um, the diffusion of the of the label is not changed, which means that uh, there is little influence. Even though there's a long strand of DNA, the influence is quite limited on the uh, on the receptor motion and interactions. Um, so we think we now have a really nice protocol for improving single particle tracking in multicolor experiments, both in the in vitro and in and in vivo. And we hope to publish this soon. So with that, uh, I really want to thank my group uh, for uh, all the work they put into this, in particular Chris, who's been the main driver of all the experiments that have presented, and our technician Elisa, who also worked together with Patrick on the uh, protein purification. Thank Patrick for all his input um, on protein-related issues. It's been a pleasure to work together. My colleague Peter Rhein for the simulations, uh, my colleagues in, in Munich, Petra Schwelle, Johannes Stein, and Florian Steyr for this. DNA pet tracking um, uh, uh, project that I presented. Um, and uh, yeah, if you uh, know someone or yourself uh, are interested in turf microscopy and may want to build one one day, then please feel free to get in touch for advice or just visit our uh, GitHub page for blueprints and protocols and analysis code as well. And with that, uh, I would very much like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. That was really impressive. Um, <clears throat> not only the, the scientific data, but I think also the, the production of the microscope is, uh, is definitely worthwhile to mention. So you mentioned that this, this is open source. So if, let's say, if we want to build our own microscope, they, they can do so with your assistance and with, with other people that, that are involved? Uh, yes, I mean, of course, you still need uh, you still need to buy all the components, and it's still I mean, cheap doesn't mean cheap. I mean, as I said, it's like around uh, 120 uh, thousand euros um, worth of components. But then I think uh, with the, if you have someone who has some understanding of optics, um, they should be able to and and a workshop that uh, can make certain parts for you from the uh, technical drawings that we provide. Then I think it should be at least a lot easier and a lot faster than if you had to start from scratch. Uh, and maybe I have one question. So I think indeed uh, what, what you showed on the the, the, the new floor four and the, the DNA paint, I think it's a, it's a very nice technique and probably this will help you in, uh, in the future. But like you mentioned, there's, there's of course other issues like uh, that you may encounter, like for instance, the, the, the proteins, the, the IL-2 and IL-15 uh, that apparently are not properly folded and that causes issues with uh, with the results. So, so do you have a kind of solution for this? Is the plan to... Uh, maybe look for new um, distributors or maybe produce the proteins somewhere else or yeah so my, our main uh, our main idea is to actually buy clinically created lichens because both of those are actually used for treating patients and they undergo much more rigorous uh, quality checks of course so we for for now hope that that will solve our problem we do know that we can i mean they can be made uh, of course i mean otherwise the companies wouldn't be able to sell them but they are also difficult to make actually and uh, we know that um, that we probably would have to spend quite some time optimizing this so we can do that as a second step, or we would do that as a second step, but we would first prefer to uh, hope to find a commercial provider that is um, so provide sufficient quality. Uh, but I think it's actually, I mean, I was really, I was actually surprised in a way because I guess I was very pessimistic thinking it's just us who can't make good proteins, but it's just a nod to say, actually, 
I mean, uh, uh, commercially available proteins are not always what they promise to be. Uh, I think that is a good reminder for people like me who sometimes think this is a shortcut. Maybe it's not a shortcut at all. And it's really worthwhile investing time and, and using expertise available in networks like Instruct Eric um, to set it up yourself in your lab. And that, yeah, that is really something that I value even a lot more now having seen this data than before. I know, for instance, that uh, because of course you're using the, the human IL2, but I know that, for instance, the mouse IL2 is apparently much more easier to produce. Um, so I'm not sure if that could be uh, something to, to check. I don't know how that would react with these, these human receptors. Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, that in that case, you would probably want to switch to the mouse receptors as well. I think that there is a difference. Um, and particularly for all these biophysical parameters, it really doesn't make sense to measure between interspecies, I, I think, unless you have a very good reason to do so. But, um, but that could be definitely also uh, uh, an idea, yes, um, then switching to the mouse system. And in terms of discrimination, I, I would personally suspect that the mechanism should be conserved, I mean, across uh, species, because, I mean, most of these things are quite conserved between mouse and human. So that's, so I wouldn't expect any big difference on a fundamental level there, maybe well, on the values, but not on the method itself. Okay. Um, so I see we have two questions in the Q&A. Um, so the first one um, complements you with the nice work. And how does the dye affect membrane interactions? So I guess the dyes are large and hydrophobic. Are there alternatives? Yes, uh, so they are actually not super large, but indeed they do uh, sometimes interact with the membrane in particular for the more hydrophobic ones. So there is a big push and there's a whole like field surrounding making fluorescent dyes for imaging. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, big, uh, well, I would say big changes that over the past 20 years has been to make those dyes more hydrophilic in fact. And uh, what we find is that um, some dyes just work really brilliantly and they don't interact with the membrane at all. And some dyes intercalate and that leads to unspecific binding or sometimes even changes in diffusion. So it's really good to be mindful of what type of dyes uh, you use. And we actually plan for this DNA pain story to also publish a screen of dyes and actually give people some feeling for um, what kind of red dyes uh, work best or like, like orange dyes, green dyes, just you know, to also put it out there, this kind of technical information so that you know what to pick. It will maybe also depend a bit on the protein you label, but I think it, it really is quite, um, it is quite transferable between different proteins of interest because it's mostly about dyes interacting as, as was suggested in the question with the membrane indeed, and that will not change. So uh, yeah, it's a, con it's, it's a concern, but I think that there are dyes on the market that do the job very well. Okay. Yeah, and on that note, what is the, the range of, uh, of what's the spectrum, basically, that you can check in your microscope? It's covering the whole UV range and, uh, and visual? Yeah, the, the whole visible range. Uh, the uh, IR uh, and UV um, uh, don't really work. UV uh, can work uh, for bulk measurements, but not for, for single molecule. Uh, the quantum yield is just too, too low. Uh, also, a lot of problems with cross excitation and, and bleaching. But, um, but yeah, so if, you, if you combine wisely, you can go from UV to, um, to, to far red with okay. the system we have. Yeah. Okay, second question from uh, Michal. Very nice work. Are the interactions of receptor components in membranes different from possible solubilized components in solution? And could you use, for instance, NMR to um, study the interactions? And it's an interesting question. I, I, I do think um, uh, if you use a liposome based system, that would be very interesting uh, to do. Um, and I, I believe you can, you can do it with NMR, but you get some problem with relaxation times because they um, are different for larger objects. But I, I thought that there are also some workarounds uh, there already. Um, I mean, in principle, I mean, the, there will be a difference always between 2D and 3D kinetics, just based very, very much based on a simple physical idea that is that these uh, rates are driven by encounter rates and they are different for oriented molecules because you restrict uh, degrees of freedom once the molecules are bound. And this can, depending on the interaction, have quite severe consequences uh, on, uh, on KDs. So 2D KD is not the same as a 3D KD. So um, I, I really think that for these kind of uh, systems where you also have different receptor subunits, it is if you really want to understand the biophysics, it is crucial to go to a 2D uh, system as well, which is why a lot of people do these, try to do these measurements on cell membranes as well. 
um, to account for that. But then, of course, it's a much messier system. So this is really, I think, where this reconstituted system comes in as a as a nice way to do, like, say, biochemistry 2.0. Because I mean, you can all, like measuring in solution has been possible for a long time, but bringing it to 2D, I think, uh, really helps us um, understand. Uh, a bit better what's what's going on in terms of uh, order of assembly, also assembly strength. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if there are no further questions, I don't see any questions uh, in the Q&A. So, Christina, I would like to thank you again for the, for the very nice presentation. And um, we'll move on to the, the final yeah. speaker. Um, we're going to move to Spain, to, to Nicola uh, Abrescia. <clears throat> He's from uh, from Bilbao, and uh, he will uh, take us to the to the virus uh, subject and actually uh, looking at uh, the change in membranes of uh, viruses when they assemble to host cells, and uh, he used to this different of uh, cryoelectro techniques, and uh, he also part uh, did part of this uh, research at uh, Niesen in the Netherlands, the, the cryo EM facility. Um, so, Nicola, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, thank you, the organizer, for uh, this opportunity, and also to the to the attendees. So I don't know if you can see the screen uh, well. I hope yes, so. we can, we can okay. see. Yeah, okay. So I am going to to tell you about uh, the structure of. Uh, um, a proteolipidic uh, viral tail tube that is used uh, uh, for uh, uh, genome uh, delivery. Uh, the, the virus or the bacteriophage that we are talking about is a lipid-contained bacteriophage BRD1, which has been uh, um, studied quite in extent uh, and uh, um, by, by uh, mainly two big groups, the Dennis Bamford group and the Davis Stewart group, respectively in Helsinki and in Oxford. And they had the chance to uh, also contribute to some of uh, uh, such an aspect. So uh, PRD1 is infects uh, Salmonella enterica, uh, so Monas originosa and the E. coli is a member of the uh, Tectiviridae family and is in a mature um, form, is a tailless uh, icosahedral uh, particle. You can see here the schematic picture that uh, we know today about uh, PRD1. It has uh, a protein capsid here in, in blue, which is formed mainly by the major capsid protein P3. Uh, below the capsid protein, you have uh, a membrane vesicle here in uh, yellow orange, which is uh, uh, actually uh, enriched in, pro in membrane proteins. And within uh, this membrane vesicle, we have uh, uh, the double strand um, DNA, which is uh, highly packaged uh, within uh, the, the, the membrane. And at the 11 of the 12 spike vertices, you have two proteins, which are called uh, P5 mainly in P2, and the P31 is the penton protein. Now, PRD1 has been, uh, uh, thanks to the numerous structural studies and, and, and the virology studies on, on, on it, as a model system for this type of uh, of uh, membrane contain uh, viruses. Uh, also another aspect that has been uh, extremely important uh, uh, that PRD1 has delivered is the fact that uh, by studying is uh, major capsid protein and the architecture of this virus, um, it has been possible to, to define what is nowadays called the structure-based phylogeny uh, of viruses. But this is, uh, this is for example, in the structure-based phylogenetic tree of the PRD1 adenoviral members, but this is part of uh, a different story. But that to tell you that uh, actually on PRD1, there is quite a lot of, there was quite a lot of, of structural information and biological information. However, one of the points that was not clear uh, was uh, uh, the mechanism of uh, infection of these uh, uh, bacteriophage. And that's the reason why we, we posed this question quite some time, quite a few years ago now, how does PRD1 infect its host? This question uh, was raised by the fact that uh, there were some images, cryo-EM images collected uh, quite some time ago by the Bamford group that show that in some cases, this icosahedral particle uh, had a protuberance from one of the vertices. Uh, so this was quite different. It's quite different from uh, the case of the tailed phages where you have a constitutively attached uh, um, tail, which is uh, actually mainly proteic tail. You can have a longer, sh uh, shorter, but still uh, constitutively attached uh, 
um, tail tubes. So we decided to study uh, what was happening in, in, in PRD1. And here you can see uh, this is a, a section of a 3D reconstruction in which you have intact particles, uh, which are called here uh, as a DNA field particle. But then uh, you could see that uh, you had uh, almost empty particle with uh, some residual DNA and uh, some long uh, extension protuberance. In this case, are longitudinal. And in this case, for example, our orthogonal view of these uh, tubes, so with the long axis perpendicular to the screen. We decided to, to take a careful look uh, at 2D images. And what you can see here on the, on, the, on the right side, where is my laser point, that actually you have like two uh, legs coming out from, uh, from the capsid. And these two legs seem to be formed by a sort of uh, bilayer, one here and one here. So we decided to, to do a single particle cryo-electron tomography reconstruction. And we detected different type of uh, uh, particles uh, inside our pool. Uh, some of them could be uh, ascribed to a sort of initial stage of the DNA ejection, where you have the internal membrane remodeling with this long tube here. And well, this is an orthogonal view of this tube uh, along this, uh, this uh, direction. And uh, we were able also to see other uh, particle type where the vesicle was uh, very uh, small, and we called these, uh, uh, this form as a map pin morphology with, the, again, the long tube here. Uh, these were, this is an orthogonal view across this uh, these, uh, these section here on the membrane. And we were able to roughly estimate the dimension of these uh, protuberance, which had a diameter of about 14 nanometers and the length, uh, an average length of 50 nanometer. Now, at the beginning, when we started this and we saw this, uh, this, uh, this structure, we thought that actually maybe uh, it was the DNA to impose uh, this tubular structure because of the highly compressed DNA inside and that would, uh, at ejection, maybe induce this tubular formation. And for this reason, we decided uh, to, to, to have a deeper look. First of all, what we noticed is that uh, the presence of the tubular structure um, was also accompanied by missing uh, complexes at the other five-fold vertices. So we look at, uh, at the individual particle imposing uh, as a single particle, as a C1 symmetry, but also imposing a 60-fold average um, symmetry, 60-fold um, symmetry. And these tell us that actually these uh, holes that we were seeing uh, along the caps, it corresponded not only to the uh, missing part of the pentons, uh, but also to the peripentonal capsomers. So these were coming as a full block uh, uh, away uh, while the tube was formed. Uh, by comparison with the, the uh, wild type uh, virion, so without, and the structure available that we uh, also got by X-ray crystallography a long time ago, we noticed that uh, this decapping of the five-fold vertices was definitely due to the loss of uh, transmembrane interaction at the, four, at the five fold vertices. The, the, we knew from the X ray structure of PRD1 that at the five fold, there is a protein called P16 that holds together, let's say, the membrane at the five fold vertices. When this uh, tube is formed, these uh, uh, interactions are lost, uh, and uh, we believe that it's inducing this uh, remodeling of, of the membrane. So, as I was saying earlier on, the, the, the initial idea was that maybe was the DNA to impose this tubular structure. So with uh, Dennis Bamford and Anna Oxen in Helsinki, um, we, we commented about it. And they, they were able to provide us a mutant particle that is called the SUS1. SUS1 PRD1 is a particle that doesn't contain the uh, P9 TPAs, and so is unable of packaging the DNA. And the, the clear uh, answer by uh, just looking at this particle was that the tube was or was uh, capable to, to to form even without the DNA, and therefore the DNA had no role in the uh, assembly of the remodeling of the vesicle membrane into a tubular structure. Plus, we were able to see different type of uh, tubularization even without even within the capsid. Here you can see actually two images in which in which you have uh, tubularization. Uh, almost at the scission uh, point, uh, and then uh, at the release point, uh, this one here. We could see incipient uh, tube forming, uh, 
almost two tubes. These are tubes seen orthogonal to the screen. Another two tubes close by, uh, orthogonal to the screen. But uh, also by having this gallery of uh, uh, 2D images, we were also noticing that the membrane uh, was displaying characteristic morphologies that uh, by comparison with, uh, for example, the response that uh, uh, the plasma membrane of red blood cells have to change in osmolarity uh, could adopt. So we have this type of conformation, which are called stomatocyte to discocyte. And these actually replicate those shape transition that you would see in uh, red blood cells when uh, they are exposed to change in osmolarity. By, uh, inferring, by inference, uh, we also thought that actually the osmolarity was uh, uh, an effect of the membrane uh, and an effect of the membrane remodeling. Because as soon as one of the uh, fivefold was the capping, there was a, a, an exchange or a, a difference in osmolarity between the outside and the inside of the virion. And these uh, would lead to these morphological changes uh, in the membrane vesicle. Now, when we look at the 2D images of these uh, uh, tubularization uh, inside what we thought was inside the capsid, we had to prove that actually they were inside the capsid. And therefore, we collect the cryo-electron tomography images, and uh, we show that tubularization was indeed happening inside when uh, the DNA was absent. Now, we also looked at the infection. Uh, so we took uh, our um, PRD1 sample, we mixed with the uh, E. coli cells, and then we put under our microscope. And I have to say this, that all this work was done uh, pre-resolution revolution. So this was, uh, uh, all these data were collected on an in-house uh, microscope. Uh, and uh, you, we were lucky to see actually the, the PRD1 at the infection stage with three different particles uh, on the same bacterial cell. So on the left side here, you see uh, the, the DNA, the, 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 the PRD1 particle with full capsid, but with an incipient tube passing the first, the, 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 the outer uh, membrane layer. In the central picture here, th these are tomograms, but these are central section of the tomograms. Here you see uh, the map pin, uh, the almost uh, a map pin morphology of the of the membrane with a slightly longer tube. And you can see that the capsid here is, is also um, uh, deformed or, or is missing uh, vertices. And a third particle, always on the same bacteriophage, shows actually a map pin morphology inside of the membrane vesicle and the long tube crossing the, 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 the outer and the inner membrane. These are segmentation done onto this volume. We also collect uh, um, epon embedded uh, section of epon embedded uh, cells. Uh, and you can see here that the DNA here is, is much strongly stained. And you can also see this uh, darker line crossing in, in between the, uh, the tube. So this was a, a snapshot of uh, the infection process collected through uh, electron microscopy. Then we wondered whether the tube had a structure. And uh, we, we did some uh, 2D analysis of the, the top view of these tubes. Uh, of course, we, we didn't have so many tubes for, for the averaging. But from the rotational analysis, we could see that probably the tube has a threefold or a sevenfold symmetry. We have to be cautious here because we, we were not absolutely sure. We are not absolutely sure about uh, um, the direction of this tube. And uh, uh, we, we, we decided to actually deeper this study. However, when we also compared the, 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 the we perform subtomogram averaging from uh, um, the, our tomograms, uh, in particular for those top views that we observed in the tomograms, we were also able to, to distinguish two different classes that uh, they were not like uh, naked cylinders, but they, 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 they show some structured, um, around the, the, the tube. So this is the orthogonal view for one class. This is another view for another class. And these are longitudinal views. These tubes are different. Now we know that these uh, additional density on the side of the tube correspond to the peripentonal capsomers that they cap uh, when uh, uh, the tube is formed and protrude from the univertex. This allow us also to 
better define the geometry and uh, um, the dimension of this uh, tube. So thanks to this work that was pre-resolution -revolu revolution, we were able to put forward a, a model of uh, genome delivery, which is shown in this schematic picture here. The, DN the, the PRD1 particle would bind through his uh, uh, one of the 11 vertices to the cellular receptor, which by the way, is not yet known, then would tumble and reorient itself uh, so that uh, from the unique vertex, the tube could uh, uh, form and uh, insert into the um, into into the cell. We don't know yet what is the triggering mechanism for the opening of the tip because there must be uh, a portion, in, a moment in which or a stage in which the tips open and the DNA uh, is shuttled inside the cell. With these uh, observations, we were able to first of all show and establish that there is a new mechanism for genome translocation for this type of uh, membrane contain um, phages or viruses. And what we observed also was that actually there were some reminiscence with the cellular nanotube that are used in cell to cell communication. Of course, the dimension are, are uh, relatively uh, different because this is a, the, the viral tail tube is, is much smaller in terms of diameter, but uh, we pondered whether the mechanism of interaction between proteins and uh, membrane would actually resume to, this, to, to similar uh, basic uh, principle of uh, membrane protein interaction. And finally, in, in, in this uh, study, we propose that maybe this proteovesicle uh, remodeling uh, uh, or the remodeling of this membrane vesicle into a, a proteovesicle tube might also uh, underpin a shuttling mechanism uh, which is common to other membrane contain viruses that possess a linear genome. But the question remained for us that uh, about uh, the, the, whether the, the tube had a structure. And that is where uh, in 2014-15, as uh, all, of you, all of us now know that there was a resolution revolution, which uh, allowed to look into, with the power of the microscope, allowed to look at much more um, challenging object like the viral tube, and also with the democratization of CAOEM, which means that nowadays everybody can use a, a high resolution, a high hand microscope, thanks to, to the facility, for example, offered by Instruct, we decide indeed to embrace into the structural determination of the mechanisms of assembly of this proteolipidic tube. And uh, this led to the second question, which is what is the, 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 the PRD1 protective tube assembly mechanism? So we decided to embrace uh, this uh, these question using two different techniques. One is atomic force microscopy that through which we wanted to, we, we, we wanted to understand the mechanical property of this tube, but is not uh, what I'm going to talk today. I will just focus on the cryo-EM. We collected several, um, movies at different uh, instruct facility, uh, majorly a uh, nascent, at uh, the SATEC and the uh, Ibic Diamond. This was essential for us because we didn't have, we don't have, we didn't have until recently a high-end microscope uh, in the Basque uh, country. And therefore uh, uh, we were uh, um, fortunate enough to collect several of uh, thousand of movies at these three different facility. And this allowed us now to focus on the, these uh, prototypic tube. We are currently working on this, but this is a, a class average of different fact segments uh, that we uh, extract from the individual tubes. Then we calculate the power spectra in order to assess whether this tube possessed an helical symmetry. This is the power spectra derived from uh, the 2D class average. And uh, uh, to us, uh, it's clear that this tube doesn't possess an helical symmetry but it seems to be more uh, related to a stacking of uh, units at a spacing of about 10 angstrom. However, because sometimes, or in certain cases, the power spectra of two class averages might be actually different, uh, it might, be, uh, uh, might not be certain, uh, we decided to calculate the power spectra of the individual a member of this class and then sum the power spectra uh, 
of uh, the individual segment. segment. And uh, you can see here that uh, actually the spacing that you have between the equators to the first layer lines is uh, similar with a similar, uh, um, sorry, with a similar uh, uh, distribution of spot along the first layer line and with the similar spacing about 10 angstrom. So with these two way of assessing whether the tube has helical symmetry, we can uh, now certainly say that the tube doesn't have an helical symmetry. And this work is ongoing. Further, always uh, working with our collaborators in Helsinki, we decided to look at some of the mutants that uh, they were able to produce. And in one of these mutants, what we notice it is that actually the tube is very short. Uh, you can see here the tube um, is less than 15 nanometers length, and then it forms this sphere that we are know is uh, that now we know is of a vesicle uh, um, origin. If you do a two class average of these type of particles, you, you you clearly see that the tube is much shorter. But also, if you start to do the same uh, image processing that you would do with the, uh, the wild type uh, tube on the on these little short uh, tubes, what you see is that you lose this patterning that you do have uh, in the tube, suggesting that uh, the protein which is uh, lacking this phenotype is uh, essential for the tube structuring. Now, I think that I almost ran out of my 15 minutes, and this was mainly a teaser of what a high powerful uh, uh, microscope can uh, deliver, and in particular, what the access to high end infrastructure can uh, allow us to, to work on. So, for the final chapter of this, uh, of this story, I hope that uh, uh, there will be a next time. And, for, and with this, I want to thank the people that has been uh, working on uh, the first questions, which are Bibiana Peralta um, and uh, Dennis Bamford, Anna Oxen, and, and Daniel Castagno. And on the high resolution structure of the tube that we are trying to address right now is Stavros Atsinas and uh, Anne Castillo Martinez, with the involvement always of Dennis Bamford and Hannah Oxenen, and Ralph Richter and Bart Hogenborn in, in UK for the IFM studies. And of course, I want to thank Instruct and all the other uh, agency for allowing me to assess uh, high-end microscopes in Europe. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any question you might have. Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, I'm looking forward to your next presentation to see uh, where, where this is all going to, but this, this was already very impressive, so uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think people are typing questions in the, the q and I have one question. Uh, actually, yes. I have two, but um, so you mentioned at the beginning, you have this uh, P16 protein that is involved in, in stabilizing the membrane and um, uh, removing of the P P16 changes the membrane. So do you know what happens if you have a mutant of the P16 or if P16 itself is completely absent? Uh, so you cannot uh, generate, you cannot assemble without P P16. So uh, P16 is an absolute requirement. You cannot have mutants with P16 uh, absent. Okay. So that, that, that tells us that is a, a, a pivotal protein for the correct assembly. Yeah. Okay. And then indeed you mentioned uh, it's still not clear which, which cellular receptor is involved in, in, in uh, attaching the virus. Is there, is there any clue or is it just really looking into the dark? Is uh, So far is looking into the dark. Uh, we, we believe it's a lipopolysaccharide on the cell surface, but uh, we, we don't know yet. And actually that is... a. Uh, is one of the bottlenecks that we do have because if we were able to uh, to find out which receptor we would be able to synchronize the tube formation which is one of the challenges that we have with this project because the tubes are appearing by aging mm -hmm. so if we had a way of synchronizing through the binding to a, a receptor would be uh, pretty good but we are we are working on it okay i can see there's one question so far in the q a um so do the individual structures used for tube and cap capsid assembly convey some information about the mechanisms of interactions during the assembly? And it's a question from Michal. Well, on the assembly of uh, PRD1, there are, there are pivotal papers that have been uh, published quite some time ago, uh, and uh, mainly by X-ray crystallography. Actually, there is a structure by X-ray crystallography dated 2004 in which uh, we explained the, the mechanism of assembly. You can see that uh, 
the, the assembly of the capsomers. The P3 is the major capsid protein which self-assemble as, as a trimer. This is the building block for the assembly of the entire uh, virus facet, which is aided by a protein, uh, which is uh, by cementing protein or a tape mentioned protein, which is called P30. So the crystal structure provides all the, the structural details for the assembly of uh, PRD1. Uh, that's the reason why it, was, it is a model system for this type of viruses. And you can see that these uh, players in the assembly can be extrapolated, for example, for larger viruses of the same, um, uh, same structure-based lineage. Um, I got another question from uh, Julie. Uh, great talk. Does the number of P16 proteins need, sorry. Does the number of P16 proteins needed to structure the tube correspond to the number present in the pentagon of the capsid? So I, I am sorry that I didn't explain uh, that I didn't explain myself clearly on this. So the P16, uh, there are five copies per the, per vertex on the eleven vertices. Uh, one of the vertices is uh, the unique vertex, and there is no P16. P16 is is uh, is a trans it has a, a transmembrane helix that penetrates the membrane, but the membrane vesicle per se has many more other membrane proteins inside. So P16 is not uh, the protein that structure the tube. Is uh, we don't know yet uh, for sure which is the protein that is structuring the tube. Um, there are candidates, uh, but uh, um, we, we, we need to make sure that those phenotypes that we see are actually uh, indicating which is the, the, the missing protein that allow the structuring. But it's not P16. P16, we, we believe it's more a membrane protein associated, uh, the, the ones that structure the tube. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions, so I think... Uh... With that, we can close this webinar. Uh, not before thanking uh, Nicola and also uh, the other two speakers. Uh, I think it was an interesting uh, webinar. I enjoyed it. Um, one last final announcement again. Um, if people are interested in joining the biannual of uh, Instruct, um, if you're really quick, you can find the link in the chat. Um, if you want to take it easy, you can also go to the website of Instruct and uh, have a look at the program and the registration. And uh, with that, uh, thank all the participants and uh, hope to see you live at some point. And thanks again. Goodbye.